1 Corinthians chapter 16. For the last three weeks of teaching that I've done, I've been speaking to you on the resurrection, talking about, is there a resurrection? How many of you know this Sunday morning we're going to be talking about the resurrection again? I'm excited about it. You know, there are some people that only come to church on Christmas and Easter. We call them CEOs. Christmas, Easter, and other special occasions. <laughs> Anywhere from two to three times a year, you see them. And they say, well, you know, the pastor, every time I go, he preaches the same message. Well, usually when you come on Easter, I'm going to talk about the resurrection. If you come on Christmas, I'm going to talk about the birth of Christ. <laughs> and if you come any other time, no telling what you might hear. But uh, uh, we're going to talk about the resurrection Sunday morning again. But I'm going to tell you, I don't ever get tired of talking about the resurrection. The resurrection is all what it's all about. If he didn't rise from the dead, where would we be? Where would we be without him coming up out of that tomb? Amen. Well, tonight we're going to move on in 16, and, and this is the last, ver uh, last chapter in 1 Corinthians. And uh, if you'll look with me, I'm going to read the very first part of this first verse. Paul addresses the church at Corinth, and he says, Now about the collection for God's people. Let's pray. Father, tonight open our eyes, our ears, and our understanding so that we might know you better. Have your way in this place tonight and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when we look at this where he talks about the collection for God's people, notice the word now in the beginning. Now about the collection. I want you to keep in mind, 1 Corinthians was a letter written in response to the church at Corinth because the Corinthians church had come to a place where there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of division. There were a lot of problems going on in this new church. This church wasn't very old. Paul had went there. He got it established. And if you remember, Paul had started a ministry. Apollos came along and, and continued to build on it. Priscilla and Aquila were also a part of the ministry there. And so there were different ones. And as we look at this, uh, in the very beginning of the chapter, he said some people were saying, well, we follow Paul. Some says we follow Peter. Some say we follow Apollos. And some say, well, we follow Jesus. Jesus. He says, wait a minute, there's only one church and there's only one leader. How many of you know who that leader is? Jesus. It's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. It's not about Peter. Yes, God used those individuals and they were great men of God, but he had to deal with that. So over these last 16 chapters, We've seen him deal with several different things. On this occasion, he's dealing with offerings for the Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, for those who are not aware, you can go back to read it in Acts, but Paul and all the churches that he established and started in, in Asia Minor and over in, in, uh, in the Capitalists and over in Corinth and that area, he began to tell them, he said, look, you owe the people in Jerusalem everything. Because had they not shared with you the gospel of Jesus Christ, you would have no hope today. And so the church in Jerusalem is struggling. They were going through a time of famine. There was no food. There was no money. It was a terrible time. And so Paul called upon all the local churches that he had established throughout all these areas. And he said, would you please take up an offering? so that we can carry that offering to go back and to help those dear saints of God who were struggling during this hard time in their life. They're going through what we would call today a recession. How many of you know we've had people in the last few years that's lost jobs, lost their houses, lost their, you know, everything. I mean, basically, had to, uh, some had to file bankruptcy. Not that that's the thing to do. But, I mean, they were just at their wits end. They knew nothing else to do because the economy collapsed the way it did. That's what was going on in Jerusalem. There was a great famine. Things had fallen apart, and there was a great distress that was going on. So... Paul is now dealing with this last question that was presented to him, now about the collection for God's people. Other issues that he dealt with in the, in the church was the divisions of the church. He dealt with sexual immorality. He dealt with lawsuits among believers. He dealt with marriage. He dealt with food sacrifice to idols. I mean, the list continues to go on of things that he dealt with. He talked about spiritual gifts and things of that nature and how to handle them within the church. 
Well, Paul tells them this is what we should do when we take up the collection for God's people, and he's talking to the church there at Corinth and answering their question. He says, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So they're saying, well, what did you tell the Galatian church? We don't know. We weren't there. Anybody with me? Y'all are awful quiet. You wouldn't sleep on me already. Do what I, what, what did he tell the Galatian church to do? Well, let's look at the next part here. In verse 2, he says, On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Paul was trying to do a couple of things here. Number one, the first day of the week. Anybody know what the first day of the week is? Help me. Sunday. Thank you very much. You say, why Sunday? I thought Monday was the first day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday was known as the Sabbath. That's what everybody called the Sabbath, a day of rest. So the first day of the week was Sunday. Now, the first day of the week is a day we celebrate the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that Jesus rose on Sunday morning? When they went early that morning to the tomb, what did they find? The grave was empty. The stone had been rolled away. The angel said, this Jesus whom you seek is no longer dead, but he's alive. It was the first day of the week. And so people began to start worshiping God and worshiping through Christ and their, their believers of Jesus Christ began their worship on Sundays, not Saturday the Sabbath. Church, we're not Seventh-day Adventists, okay? We are Pentecostals here. Amen? Amen? We're Pentecostals. We believe in the resurrection. We believe on the day of Pentecost that God poured out his spirit on all flesh. Come on. And we know that that was a day that the church came to celebrate, and we celebrate. So he says, when you come to church, when you come, whether it was in a house church or where it was at, when you come, he says, I want each of you to set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Now, Paul did not say here in this passage that you are to have to give 10%. I believe the 10% is your automatic tithe that you already give. He's talking about above and beyond. It's like what we did two weeks ago whenever we took up an offering for fire Bibles. Hopefully you didn't spend your tithe money on the fire Bible. This was above and beyond. I want you to know God expects our tithe. It's what we do above that God really blesses us in abundance for. Amen. And so when we give and above, so he says, keep it inside a sum of money in keeping with your income. I believe why he said in keeping with your income is because not everybody in this room earns the same figures. Okay, some of you here, you may be making good money. Others of you, well, how many of you know almost every money is good if you got some? <laughs> there you go, okay. And so there's some, though, that are maybe you're making $50,000 a year. And some of you are making 30000 Some are making twenty. Some of you say, well, I'm living on, on Uncle Sam. He, you know, he's paying my disability or my retirement or whatever, and, and I don't make that kind of money. I believe what Paul was saying, give according to what your means is. It's not how much you give, but give in accordance to what you have. And, and so it's any way we do any kind of offerings, it's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. How many of you understand? It's equal sacrifice. Everybody gives a little above and beyond in, in portion. And so Paul was saying, bring it in every week. So take a little side. So maybe, maybe you say, well, I'm going to double tithe and I'm going to tithe my regular tithe to the church, and I'm going to tithe to the, to the help of the, the others, so I'm going to give 20% of my income. I'm, I'm just pulling that number out of the air. Please don't make me think, don't think that I'm telling you that's what you're supposed to do. It may be 2%, maybe 5%, but can you imagine if you take that extra couple percent and you put it together, and if you were given $100 in tithes, because you made $1,000 in tithes a month, now I'm given $100 in tithes a month, and I'm going to go ahead and give an extra 100 If you were to give $100 a month, how many of you know what it would take 12 months? You'd have how much? How much? Come on, math. $1,200, yes. Very good. Okay. 
How many of you know if you had to write out a check tonight for $1,200, it might be difficult? But if you took a little bit each week, $25 a week, you know, four weeks in a month, it's not so hard. How many of you know it's a whole lot easier to do that? It's kind of, how, how many of you uh, have to pay for insurance? The rest of you are lying. We all pay for insurance. Or you ain't driving a car. Or you don't have a house or something. Okay? I can't pay that bill when it comes due every year. And they say I owe $800 or $600, you know, at one time. And I divide mine up by the month. They, they let me, I pay extra a couple dollars to do that. But it's a whole lot easier to budget my money at, at you know, $50 a month instead of $800 one time a year. Now, I could save it and put it aside, but some of you know you're not good at saving things, are you? You'll spend it on something else before it gets there. Okay? And so it's easy to budget out. Paul was trying to just say, look, do a little bit each week. That way when I come, it won't be a need to do a big offer. It won't be that big of a thing to do. And that's what he was trying to get across to him there. And he says, and, and y'all go ahead and get it done so that when I come, people don't think you're taking the offering up for me. I want you to know, Paul told the church at Corinth, you'll see in chapter 9, he said, look, you know, though I am a servant of God and I am do what I should get, he says, I don't want to be a burden to you. He says, I'm coming, I'm, I'm a tent maker. I'm earning my own income so that, I'm not, so that I can preach the gospel freely. I can say what I want to say and I can do what I feel like I need to do and not be concerned about who gives and who doesn't give. That's the way he looked at it. And so Paul says, I don't want you to take the offering up when I get there. Because I don't want anybody to think that I'm taking that money home. It's not going with me. It's going to a people group that needs it. There's a people that are hungry and thirsty. They're, they're in need of help. So Paul begins to, to share that idea with them. So save it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. He says, then when I arrive, I will give letters to introduction to the men that you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. These were men that will be sent as guardians over this offering. They're custodians, if you will. They were to be responsible that the money was turned over to the right people. You know, how many of you know sometimes there are people that come through and they say, well, we're going to do this with the money. We're going to do that. And, and we never hear where money ever went. Have you ever wondered about that? I don't like to wonder. I don't like to think about it. But Paul says, we're not going to let you wonder. We're going to send men from your own congregation as we take this offering so that they can come back and testify to you how God touched these people and how God did a miracle for them and blessed them. So he says, I'll send them letters of, of uh, go with them. Okay. He says, and if it seems, in verse 4, if it seems advisable for me to go also, uh, they will accompany me. Basically, he's saying, if I need to go when they're going, and I have missionary duties to do and perform, I will go with him also. Looking on down at verse 5, he says, After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay there for a while, even spend the winter with you, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. He said, well, Pastor, I thought you said you didn't want no money. Well, his help was not necessarily a monetary help that he was looking for. Paul was still in Ephesus when he writes this letter to church at Corinth. Remember, he sent these men to him with a letter. And his plan was to go through Macedonia to visit the Philippian church and all the believers there in the northern area of Greece. And he was going to work his way around the coast. I don't have the map up there tonight, but if you look in your Bible, you'll see the map. And, and he would work his way up from Ephesus all the way around through Macedonia and back, back down into Greece and into Corinth there. And, and he intended to stay there for the winter. Um, this was now about the time of the Passover. And uh, so it was probably in the early spring or, or late spring. And so we're looking at probably around April. And so the journey that he intended to do was after the Passover, he would leave and go through Philippi, Macedonia area, and on back down. So he was going to winter there. Winter, if you remember in our studies in the book of Acts, I talked about they didn't like to travel from about the middle of October or September 
till after the first of the year, till probably February or so. And so his goal was to stay with them for a couple of months. So he would travel that journey, stay there, and spend time and instruct them and help them. Um, as far as financial help, basically what Paul was looking for was help and supplies and equipment that he would need to take for his journey. As much more than that, he wanted their prayers. He wanted their prayers to help him. How many of you know prayers is what we need? You know, prayer, so, you know, we have missionaries come through all the time. We think, well, they just want our money. No, they're asking for prayer. They're fixing to leave their home, their family. They're leaving everything that they, they've always known to go and to serve in a foreign land and to give of their life and their self and to do what they can to touch people's hearts and lives for the kingdom of God. And they know they can't do it on their own. They know that it's got to be God's help that helps them to accomplish what they have to do. So in verse 7 in our text, he says, I don't want you to see now, I don't want to see you now and make only a passing visit. And this is what his response was when he said, I'm going through Macedonia, but I hope to spend some more time with you if the Lord permits. How many of you know that's a good phrase to have? We a lot of times say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. How many of you know, we ought to probably just put the end of phrase that I said, Lord willing, if the Lord permits. You know, we all have good intentions, but sometimes God has other directions and plans. Anybody ever change your plans? It wasn't your intention to change the plans, but God changed the plans for you. And, and so, it's, you know, we used to say, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Well, most of us don't have to worry about the creek unless you live over there in McClenny and the, and the river rises and you can't get across the bridge. But, but here we are and we're good. Uh, Timothy goes on, he says here in verse, verse uh, 8, rather, he says, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. How many of you know Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover? Thank you. Let me say it again. Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover. This Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. It's the Passover season. Pentecost Sunday is 49 days after Easter Sunday, okay, or 50 days. We'll see it, what, seven times seven? So seven weeks from today, or this Sunday, we'll be celebrating what we call Pentecost Sunday. Guess who's coming on Pentecost Sunday? Alan Griffin. How many of you know we can stand a little fire shut up in our bones here? Come on. We're going to have a good time with Alan Griffin on Pentecost Sunday. Paul says, I'm going to try and stay in Ephesus here until Pentecost because a great door has opened for me, and it's effective work. This, this thing's really taking place, and he says, I, I'm excited. If you go back and read chapter 19 in, in the book of Acts, in chapter 19 in the book of Acts, you'll see where Paul was preaching and people were taking the, the clothing that he was wearing and, and he would take it off because he would become perspired with the sweat. And people would take the cloth and they'd cut it up into little prayer cloths and they would take it to sick people and sick people were being healed just by faith alone. They said this is a cloth that was on the, the man Paul who preaches about Jesus who has touched people. People have been raised up and healed and delivered and they would take them to sick people and they would lay it on them and they would have that prayer of faith with them. God would raise it. God was doing extraordinary things in Ephesus. Great things are happening. Read the first part of chapter 19 in Acts. But then guess what? The devil stepped in. Y'all are awful quiet tonight. Come on, the devil stepped in. I was preaching revival last night and I got a little excited. Come on, help me. The devil stepped in. <laughs> The devil stepped in. Oh, me. I got the lively bunch tonight. They like to shout at me down last night. Come on, somebody. The devil likes to stick his old head up when God's doing something good, doesn't he? And a fellow by the name of Demetrius there, he was the head of all the, the silversmiths. He was the head of the union there. They had a silversmiths union. And he was in charge of all this. And, and he finally got all those silversmiths together. He said, look, 
This guy, Paul, is messing up our business. He's telling us that, that these shrines that we make and sell for profit for a living, they're not really a God at all, and that people should quit buying them, and that they should start serving and living for God. They should serve Jesus Christ, and he's messed up our business. And so they called together a big rally, and they met there, and, and all of a sudden, they were about to take the head of Paul off. They were ready to get him. And they said, look, one of the guys stopped the whole thing in chapter 19. You'll see it. And he says, y'all are about to have a riot here. You better settle down. Paul at that point knew that his ministry in Ephesus was complete. He had to leave. The Bible says he left that night. He slipped away. And he went on back up towards Macedonia doing the work that God had called him to do. You see, God did not call him to be a martyr at that point in his life because there were more things that he needed to do. Remember what Jesus told the disciples when, when he sent them out to do ministry? He sent them out and he says, look, he says, the people that you go to, when you go to that house, if they'll receive you, stay with them. Don't move from house to house, but stay in that same house until you're ready to move on to the next city. If they don't receive you and they don't accept you in that city, he said, do what? Shake the dust off your feet. Shake the dust off your feet and move on. If they're not willing to accept it, Paul got to the place where he had preached it. It was successful. Multitudes were being saved. He had established a great work in the city of Ephesus. But God had more for him to do than to die right then. There was still more to be done. And so he had enough established that he could move on and leave others behind to continue the work. And Verse 10, it says, if Timothy comes to see it, uh, comes, see to it, and, and basically what Paul is telling them here, because I'm stopping to start, I need to explain this. Paul was trying to tell the church at Corinth, when Timothy comes to you, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he's with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. Now, for those who don't remember, Timothy was a young man. Timothy, if you look at the book of Timothy and read First and Second Timothy, you'll hear as Paul talks about him and how his mother and grandmother had raised him in the ways of the Lord. His father was not necessarily a godly man, but his mom and grandmother were, and they had trained him and taught him. And when Paul came along, Paul took him as a young man, and he mentored him. He discipled him, and he trained him. He became the next apostle Paul, if you will, being underneath his hands and underneath his feet. He was there to serve. And so Paul was sending him on to Corinth ahead of him. And he said to those in Corinth, he said, look, when this young man comes, you make sure that he doesn't fear any of you. How many of you know that sometimes there's some bullies in churches? Some of you look at me funny. Oh, yeah. Let me just tell you, I was, I was having breakfast this morning with Eric. I preached for him last night, and he lives out here. So we had breakfast this morning, he and Ted and I and, and, and uh, David. And Eric and I were talking about after Eric left me uh, or left our church uh, years ago, he had served us for a long time, and he left. He, he got an opportunity to go serve at another church as a youth pastor down in Orlando. And uh, he went to a, a very good-sized church, uh, very promising things. He said one month into his ministry there at the church, at the conclusion of that Sunday morning service, the pastor had preached a great message, but he says, well, folks, today, this is my last day with you. I'm leaving. He had had enough. There were some men on the board that had ruled that church and reigned that church and wouldn't let the man of God do what he had to do. They had been through, the church was like 50 years old and had 60 pastors. Does that tell you something? They wouldn't let the man of God do what he had to do. And Eric, Eric and Kimberly had just moved everything down there. They, they were like, uh, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, because their job was over. And that day, some of the men came to him and said, look, we'd like for you to help fill in until we select a new pastor. And so Eric said, sure. So he, he filled in for a while, and finally uh, he turned his name in. Well, those men were very happy because Eric was very young, wasn't very mature, and they could kind of tell him how they wanted things to be done. And, and whenever Eric began to show that he had a little backbone and began to stand up and say, this is what God wants to do, not what you want to do, uh, well, Eric became number 61. <laughs> a year later, he was gone. There are bullies in churches. 
whether, you know, and I thank God our church is not necessarily that way. I've been very thankful, or I would have been going a long time ago, <laughs> you know, but God has given us a great leadership team. But some churches have them, and Paul knew that there were some men and women in the church there in Corinth that could really challenge Timothy's authority. And he said, look, you see to it that he has nothing to fear when he gets there. And, and if you, you don't understand, let me just tell you, Paul even wrote this letter to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. He says, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. How many of you know what I'm talking about tonight? Don't fear what the enemy wants to do. You stand firm in what God says. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, he tells Timothy this. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because of you, you are young. He says, but set an example for the believers in speech and life and love and faith and purity. Basically, he says, live a godly example before them. Have, be a man of integrity. Don't, don't make compromise. Stand up. And uh, Paul was very insistent as he told the church in Corinth, in verse 11, he goes on to say, No one then should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me, for I am expecting him along with the brothers. And, and Paul had sent a couple other men with him. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 19, you'll see in verse 22, he sent two of his helpers. Timothy and Erastus had went to him, uh, went to Macedonia and on around into uh, and to Corinth there to do the work that he had called him to do. In verse 12 in our text, we see that he says, Now about our brother Apollos. Remember, Apollos was, was one that had preached there before. And people were asking the question. This, is, again, is a question. When you see the word now in, in 1 Corinthians, he's responding to their question. Tell us about Apollos. What's going on in his life? Where's happened to him? And he says, Now about Apollos. I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go right now. You know why? Because he liked the ministry that was going on in Ephesus. He enjoyed what was happening. He said, let me stay here a little bit longer, Paul. He says, but he will go when he has the opportunity. In verse 13, he says, but be on your guard. How many of you know we've all got to be on our guard? The Bible says that Satan is like a lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, he's, he's roaring. He's always trying to come against you, and we've got to stand our ground. We've got to stand firm. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. You know, some people say, well, it's the truth. Have you ever heard people say, well, I would just tell them the truth? Church, not all the time do you have to speak the truth if you can't speak it in love. Better to just shut your mouth. Hello. Can I say it again? Close your mouth. If what you have to say is not said in love, it may be the truth, but sometimes the truth can be said in such a way that it tears down and destroys. Sometimes it's better just to back up and say, Holy Spirit, you deal with this and yield to him. Anybody? I, I didn't hear a whole lot back there. Come on. You see, there are a lot of truths I can tell you tonight about some people, but not everybody needs to hear them. Hello? Amen. When we speak the truth, it ought to be in love. It ought to be uplifting. It ought to be encouraging, edifying, building up, not tearing down and destroying. If it's something negative, you, you might have to just keep it to yourself. Get on your knees and pray about it. Come on. You hear me? Do your best. Let's not destroy, but let's build up. Be on your guard. Do everything in love. Verse 15 says, You know that the household of Stephanus were, were the first converts in, in Achaia there. He says, And they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Paul had won Stephanus and his whole household to the Lord while he was there ministering in Corinth. And matter of fact, if you go back to the first part of, of the book of Corinthians, you'll see here in chapter 1 where Paul's talking about Apollos and Paul. And his, he said, Look, I didn't baptize anybody but this family. And I'm glad I didn't because it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And so as we look at this word, 
He said, these people, Stephanus, he was one of the first converts. He's mature. He's more mature than most of you. Some of you have come to the Lord since then. And he's devoted himself to the service of the saints. So I urge you, brothers, to submit yourself to these and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. When you're looking for direction and wisdom and counsel, you know, if you don't go to the pastor, at least go to somebody in the church that's been living for God for a long time. Come on. Get some godly counsel. And can I just say this too? Just because they, they've been going to church a long time doesn't necessarily mean they all have godly counsel. Some of them just sit on a pew and their heart's not where it needs to be. So observe their lifestyle. Is their life which is uplifting to God? I mean, let's take it out of account just time, but let's look at what are they exemplifying. Does their life exemplify Christ? Or do you see a lot of worldliness in them? If they're worldly, it's not the example you want to follow. You say, Pastor, there's worldly people in the church. Yep. There's a lot of people you can't tell the difference between the world and the church because of the things that they participate and do. Is it something Christ would do? Come on. I'm kind of preaching at you tonight, trying to get you to stretch your mind, thinking about, boy, I want to finish this up tonight. Hang with me just for a minute. Verse 17 says, I was glad when Stephanus and Fortunus and, and Achaeus there arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. In this verse, Paul is talking about these three men came with the letter from the church at Corinth to him asking these questions. Tell us about sexual immorality. These are the divisions we're having in the church. This is a problem we're having with this, and this is a problem we're having with that. We need some instructions, and so all of 1 Corinthians is a teaching and a training for the church at Corinth and how they should discipline themselves, how they should live for God, how they should serve the Lord. And he says, when you sent these three men to me with this letter, it renewed my faith that you had confidence that I was a man of God, that I was the one that had led you to Christ, and that you're looking for spiritual insight and counsel from me so that we can continue our relationship together as Christians and serving the Lord. You see, he hadn't heard anything, and he heard in the stories of how bad things were. He says, I'm glad that you've called. I'm glad, you know, a lot of people come and say, Pastor, I hate to bother you with this. Paul, that's the way Paul would say, hey, I'm glad you came. Thank you. Thank you. Verse 18, for they refresh my spirit and also yours. He says, such men deserve recognition. And then in verse 19, he starts his, his farewell to them in this particular letter. He writes another letter, which we'll get into, but uh, second, 1 Corinthians 19 uh, 16, 19 says this. The churches in the providence of Asia send you greetings. It's kind of his final closing on this. Aquila and Priscilla, these were two people that they looked up to, greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the churches that meet at their house. And he says in verse 20, all the brothers here send you greetings. He says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And this holy kiss was one that they do Men with men, and it wasn't on the lips, I don't think. If you come kiss me on the lips, I'm going to slap you. Okay? I let my wife kiss me on the lips, or maybe my grandbabies. But uh, any of you men come up here, I'm going to kiss you back. <laughs> no, it was an embrace and more of a old brother uh, Trask. He was our, one of our former district superintendents. Get up here. Come here. This way, I'm going to kiss you, the brother the kid. They would do this, too, like that, and they're like, you know, kind of like that. Maybe on the cheek, or, or maybe just pretend like you kissed, you know. That's, but you couldn't go to him without him, you, you couldn't even greet him without him hugging you like that and doing both sides. It's kind of a European, or, or, or you know, it's, it's just something that was a custom of them. And so he says, greet them with a holy kiss. Notice he, he's, he's talking here, and, and really the emphasis was men with men and women with women. We don't want to set the wrong influence here. Amen? 
And so he says in verse 22, he says, If anyone does not love the Lord, I'm just waiting for the rest of the heads to pop up. They're slowly going pop, 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 pop. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. This morning in my devotions, I began reading the second half of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Yesterday was the blessings. For those who obey the words of the Lord and follow him, blessed you will be when you're coming in and you're going out. Blessed you will be this. Blessed you will be that. And today in the second part, Cursed of you, and, and, and oh, and it's cursed when you're coming in, and cursed when you're going out, and all your 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 cattle will be cursed, and all your sheep will be cursed, and all. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to serve the Lord. I love Him. I don't want to be under a curse, Amen. And He says, "Blessed are those and are, who serve the Lord." But if anybody doesn't serve the Lord, curses be on him. Verse 23, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you, and my love to all you in Christ Jesus. Amen. As Paul closes out the first chapter, or the first book of Corinthians here. Will you stand with me tonight as we close? Lord, I pray tonight that as we have taken these last several months to go through the book of 1 Corinthians, Lord, we've taken time just to study your word God, help us to remember why it's there. Lord, it's for us to learn how to behave as Christians. 1 Corinthians is there for us to know how to act as godly men and women. Lord, I pray that we will read it often and that, Father, we will apply your principles to our lives so that we will serve you and please you. For, Lord, that's our desire is to please you. For, Lord, if it wasn't for you, we'd have no reason to be here tonight. Lord, I thank you that you loved us so much that you looked beyond our faults, you looked beyond our, our failures, and you loved us so much that you gave your life so that we might have life everlasting. God, help us to live a life that's pleasing to you, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday morning. And when I say he is risen, you will respond by saying he is risen indeed.